I bring the weather and a quarterback. <laughs> Thank you. So he's a, he is a uh, marketing kid. I was telling Dr. McMahon earlier that when he got the Heisman, I turned to one of my friends at Baylor and said, we will never feel this good about an athlete at Baylor again. Uh, he's a remarkable young man. He took Latin as an elective for his language. And he uh, got an A. So rem re really remarkable kid. I hope he continues to be successful on the field. Uh, he doesn't get injured and end up teaching Latin over here at the back. <laughs> I'm going to read a short passage from James Joyce, who is among the greatest uh, Irish uh, writers ever, and probably the greatest writer of the 20th century. Uh, I first read James Joyce in uh, Dr. Buckoff's class. We read a short story from Dubliners. I'm going to read the very end of Dubliners called Evelyn. We read that short story in his class when I was, uh, when I was here at Damatha. Um, just a couple words about the characters here. The, the, the ending of this is, is beautiful. It's considered one of the greatest endings of any piece of literature. And I think there's good reason for that. We have a couple of characters, Gabriel, who's an older man with his wife, Greta, who's also older. He's cosmopolitan. He likes to think of himself from the east of Ireland and from even from England. Um, his wife is from the west. And the west shows up here in this passage both as a symbol of death, as it often does in literature, but also as a symbol of primitive, real Ireland, not the cosmopolitan Ireland. If you know anything about Joyce, he grew up and got out of Ireland almost as quickly as he could, and barely ever came back, but he spent his whole life writing about Ireland. Every book he read was about Ireland, including a series of short stories. This is Gabriel at the end. After he, He's a very self-important, even pompous individual, very cosmopolitan, as I mentioned. He's just realized that his wife has spent most of their marriage, in some sense, pining for a young man who was her great passion when they were teenagers, and who died at a very young age. And she's just made this, in a sense, confession to him of her love for this, this boy who died. She falls asleep. He's left. There's been this forecast of snow covering the whole of Ireland. And he's left alone in their bedroom, considering his life is his passage. The air of the room chilled his shoulders. He stretched himself cautiously along the sheets and lay down beside his wife. One by one, they were all becoming shades. Better pass boldly into that other world in the full glory of some passion than fade and wither dismally with age. He thought of how she who lay beside him had locked in her heart for so many years that image of her lover's eyes when he had told her that he did not wish to live. Generous tears filled Gabriel's eyes. He had never felt like that himself toward any woman, but he knew that such a feeling must be love. The tears gathered more thickly in his eyes, and in the partial darkness he imagined, he saw the form of a young man standing under a dripping tree. Other forms were near. His soul had approached that region where dwell the vast hosts of the dead. He was conscious of, but could not apprehend, their wayward and flickering existence. His own identity was fading out into a gray, impalpable world. The solid world itself, which these dead had one time reared and lived in, was dissolving and dwindling. A few light taps upon the window pane made him turn toward him. It had begun to snow again. He watched sleepily the flakes, silver and dark falling obliquely against the lamplight. <clears throat> the time had come for him to set out on his journey westward. Yes, the newspapers were right. Snow was general all over Ireland. It was falling on every part of the dark central plain, on the treeless hills, falling softly upon the bog of Allen, and further westward, softly falling into the dark, mutinous Shannon waves. It was falling, too, upon every part of the lonely churchyard on the hill where Michael Fury, that's the young man, uh, the romance of his wife, lay buried. It lay thickly drifted on the crooked crosses and headstones, on the spears of the little gate, on the barren thorns. 
His soul swooned softly and slowly as he heard the snow falling faintly through the universe and faintly falling, like the descent of their last end upon all 